Media mogul. covers your story, your story will be oh, covered in the ground up. Alright, so we're back with an all new episode. You know I've had everybody on here. I've had a goat. I had I had actually another goat of rap, Cardi B, but now I have a goat of the journalism and broadcast game. Jamil Hill. I read a, read this book in two days. 240-something pages in two days. The Uphill, the memoir of Jamil Hill. Let's welcome her to the show. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it, first of all, you, you've always been supportive of the Hollywood Unlocked brand. You came on the show before in Costa when I wasn't there, and I was mad I couldn't be there because one thing I respect about you is the fact that you're smarter than a lot of people I know, but you're also still very hood. <laughs> <laughs> and I never understood how you could be so smart, respected in journalism, both broadcast and print, and still be so grounded in your blackness, which is just amazing. So welcome to the Jason Lee Show. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'm glad we get to have this conversation. It was a lot of fun doing Hollywood Unlocked, don't yeah. get me wrong, but I definitely wanted to be in conversation yeah. with you. So this is great. Yeah, no. Okay, so I was looking through this book and when I was reading it page by page, and just so those of you that say you read, but you really don't. I put tabs and there's actually <laughs> highlights in here because the things that she was saying, um, you know, you look at people's faces or covers and you don't know all the stuff they've been through. Right. I think people will look at you as having such a successful career, not just in print journalism, but with ESPN, Sports Center, all that, and now with all your new stuff, and not know that you've been through hell and back. Yeah, I mean, I think that was kind of the whole point of doing the memoir is that there's not usually a part two to a memoir. So I, I felt like I would be being very dishonest with people if I didn't really put it out there. And you you get these kind of rare opportunities to tell your story, to control your own narrative. And so with this opportunity to do that, I would be remiss if I did not tell people and expose myself to like, this is how I grew up. This is what my circumstances were like. This is these are the things that shape me. So when I come with a certain opinion or worldview, now you know how it was shaped and formed and where it came from. Your sweater says Black Detroiters. Right. I think if people just knew that you were born in Detroit, that will really set the tone for the type of person you are. <laughs> and they have to know that I'm from, you know, like to quote Jay-Z, I'm from the real hood, not the rap hood. Yeah. Right. And it's like, I'm from Detroit, Detroit. Right. Not the outskirts. I ain't from Kia Rocks, Detroit, because he ain't from Detroit. Right. I'm not from those places. I'm from real Detroit, a West Sider, went to Mufford High School. But there comes like, there's a certain level of pride for Detroiters and coming from Detroit. The yeah. only other family I know in Detroit are the Clark sisters. Oh, yeah. You know, and I've been we trying to, to get, high school. I've been trying to get out there to their church because yeah. I'm a huge fan of Detroit. And then we also know that the Ford Motor Company is in Detroit. Dude, the winers, they are from Detroit, right? So what, what, what is the Detroit pride about? Where does oh, that come from? Well, it's, it's, it's like this. All right. You look at all the major cities in the U.S. And at one point, Detroit was, Detroit was looked at, it, it was one of the most profitable, richest cities in the world, not just the country, because of the auto industry. But you look at all the major cities today. You got L.A., Chicago, um, you know, New York, Atlanta. Miami, Atlanta. Those are all considered, despite having the same problems as Detroit, the cool city where you want to hang out, where you want to get put on, all those things. And Detroit wasn't really known for that. I mean, of course, you have a whole legacy in Motown that came from there. You have a gospel legacy that the came Eminem? Uh, yes, I mean Eminem. Eminem is from Detroit. Like he's way more Detroit than like Kid Rock is, because like, mm -hmm. he's actually you know kind of from Detroit. But we had a gospel legacy, as you mentioned, the Clark, Clark sisters, Winans, Fred Hammonds from Detroit, all of which again oh, wow. went to my high school. Wow. And so there was a certain legacy, but people didn't see it as a place that you got put on at. They saw it as a place that you kind of disrespected. We were considered a crime center, a crime nerve center. When I was growing up, the only time Detroit made the national news is when the murder rate came out, and we were usually in the top three, if not number one. Uh, or we had this very horrible tradition that I write about in, in my book called Devil's Night, where the night uh, of Halloween, we set fire to the city, right? You're talking about four or 500 fires in one night. Mm -hmm. And we have the riots. So people knew Detroit for all these violent things. And so people who are from Detroit, who came from the mud, who know how to hustle, we take a pride in our city because we know nobody else will. Mm -hmm. Don't nobody else in Detroit like we do in mm -hmm. Detroit. And so 
We know LA is gonna have that Hollywood reputation. People want to hang out there. Like people from the city put on for the city because we're the only ones that will do it. And do people on the outside maybe look at Detroit as the headlines that they've read or, or that they read about or that they've seen online and not because it's a destination city like a Miami or an Atlanta or LA? Yeah, they, they, we're, we're very much defined by the headlines. Like I remember during the recession, all those stories got out about the fact that you could buy a house in Detroit for $1,000. Yes, that was true, but we became, again, the butt of the jokes, right? Like where everybody jokes about how poor we are, how we don't have this or don't have that because we're not considered to be, as you said, a destination city. I do feel like that has changed. Um, it is not, it may not, we, we ain't going to never have a beach. It's not going to be 80 degrees year right. round in Detroit. Right. But I think because of, say, you know, Cash Dial and Big Sean, you see the success of BMF, like all these creators are coming out of Detroit. I think people have developed a new respect for our city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Floyd Mayweather's from Michigan, too. Uh, Grand, Grand Rapids, Rapids. But that ain't, that ain't the same. It's, okay, so... Grand Rapids is about... Man, Grand Rapids is probably three hours from Detroit. But is it... Is, is the community similar? No. It's not. It's not. I mean, they have pockets of Grand Rapids that are similar. Okay. But what is more similar to us would be Saginaw, Flint. Like, they're more similar to us, mm -hmm. I feel like, than, than Grand Rapids mm -hmm. is. Okay, let's talk about Flint. Why is it that the Flint water crisis is still not a daily crisis in America? Because I look at the headlines, and we focus on a lot of things which are all important, but I feel like Flint is usually, like, it's sprinkled in here and there when it's... A lot of people should have been going to jail mm -hmm. for that. And really, we saw a reincarnation of that in what happened in Jackson. Mm -hmm. Like, the same thing happened in Flint. And really, um, we have a whole nother show about environmental racism because it specifically harms, you know, black and brown communities. Because this is where it's usually in our communities where they're building nuclear plants. It's usually in our communities where the water quality is not very good because they know they that there is no, um, you know, there's not a lot of people who are going to fight for those communities. And so um, what happened in Flint was a tragedy. It's, it's something that is not over. These are people that still have to live with this for generations of people from Flint will be affected by this. And I wish, you know, unfortunately, we are in like a 24 hour news cycle, a very fast food attention, you know, type of mentality that we had. So those things come and go, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So, OK, now, Michigan, we understand that's a big part of your upbringing. But I went and read through this book. And like I said, I read every single page and um, it, you know, reading about your upbringing with your mom, your dad. Um, the many relationships your mom went through, mm -hmm. why she went through those relationships, your perception of that and your experience with that, the grandma, all that. I was thinking about the book I wrote, God Must Have Forgotten About Me, and then reading your book, Uphill, and the parallels were just crazy. Um, but you had this affection to want to be your mother's daughter and have this relationship. Where did you... Well, first, let's talk about the upbringing. Okay. Um, now, your mother wasn't on heroin, your stepdad, your dad was. My father, uh, yes, he was. My mother definitely did heroin before. Later. Yes, later on. Um, she started, I, which is something I didn't discover until I started writing this book, because I talked to my mother extensively. We had very long conversations. So you asked her input on the book? Oh, yeah, I did. Really? Because my mother was uh, the central figure of my life. That's who raised me. And I had to witness her at her worst. And so to me, the fair thing to do would be to ask her. I didn't need her permission, but it felt good that I had it. Mm -hmm. And it felt good that we were able to kind of go over these um, moments and instances and me to be able to be more clued into what her bottoms were. Mm -hmm. Because some of those happened and I didn't know. Some of them happened when I was at college and I had no idea. And so it was the grace and empathy I already had kind of doubled basically mm -hmm. after talking to her. But I mean, she started snorting uh, heroin when she was 11. Mm. And she was, you know, I guess for people to have full context and understanding, you know, my mother was sexually abused by her uncle from ages four to 11. Mm -hmm. And that drove a lot of the issues she's experienced as a young child and then even later as a, an adult when she was a rape survivor. And so um, she experimented with a lot of drugs, but I would have to say that, you know, probably her main go-to were, were probably pills. See, my mother was on heroin at an early age. Mm -hmm. And so when your mother had uh, been involved with drugs earlier and then later on in life, 
and then she was there with your father. When did you know drugs was playing a part in your house? So like, what age did you acknowledge? So my father and my mother, they were never married and they broke up when I was young. You know, like, I mean, I, I think I, they were basically starting to break up when I was born. Mm -hmm. And so my father's recovery came much sooner. So they never were in that lifestyle together, together. Okay. right? Because when my mother was going through her bout with drugs, my father was already kind of cleaning up from that. And again, they were not together, but he and I were sort of estranged until he kind of figured uh, his own life out. But um, growing up with a mother who's on drugs, and you know, you you know this intimately well, given what your backstory is, is that it's as a child, you know, you lean, you look at your parents as superheroes, and it's hard not to because they they've been your only source of support, guidance, all of those things, and. I just didn't have any real understanding of what my mother was going through. And so all I could think about is that there's all these things I have to manage. When you have to manage somebody's addiction and you're eight, nine, 10 years old, it's not easy. I mean, literally coming home from school, I'm like, I don't know what shape my mother's gonna be in. Like, I don't know what mood I'm gonna catch. I don't know if some people she copping from gonna be at the crib. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen when I walk through this door. And that can, when you're going through it and surviving it, it normalizes. But then later on, when I reflect back, I'm like, damn, that was kind of fucked up that I had to go through that, all <laughs> right. right? So and that's uh, why when people think of like the lifestyles that some people, some people have privileged lives. I look at some of my friends now, they have both parents, mm -hmm. parents both have good jobs. They may not be the best jobs, but they're decent jobs. They're able to have some level right, of stability. They're able to provide, yeah. Your whole childhood seemed like you were just in an unstable moment after one. And I mean, it's, it's just continued to have this uphill for the <laughs> lack of better words. Um, battle. Did you feel that when you were in it? No, because when you're in it, you don't know anything else. Mm -hmm. And so you think Even that, when you were looking around at your peers? Well, and I, the only thing that told me that this this is not how this should go is is obviously pop culture, you know, mm -hmm. television. I'm watching, you know, shows like Who's the Boss? Like, okay, I mean, <laughs> Samantha Maselli gets to come home <laughs> to, you know, not this kind of culture, but I'm coming home to something different. So, like, I knew I, there were context clues that this was not necessarily normal, but it became normalized because it was so part of my everyday. And um, the one thing, because people often ask, you know, you sort of alluded to this in a, a few moments ago. I think people expected me or somebody who grew up in, in similar circumstances to come out with a lot of anger. And I'm not saying that anger wasn't there, but I still have a lot of respect and have always had a lot of respect, reverence and love for my mother because the one of the things she never did was make her lifestyle or the things she was going through seem like it was cool. Like she never did that. Mm -hmm. She was, and I know this can be a conflicting message for a kid, but you know, I grew up in that generation of parents that were like, do as I say, not as I do. Right. And you know, as I wrote about in the book, like when she showed me crack, she showed me crack because she didn't want me to do it. The way you describe crack, let me just tell you, um, you have to read the book. I haven't seen crack in so long. <laughs> I don't even know where crack is these days. <laughs> but when you describe crack, I literally went back to what I remember crack looking like. And people that have seen crack, you know what we're talking about, but she describes it in the book to a T. Yeah, because like, you know, I mean. I, no, because in, in LA, everybody's out here partying with cocaine. Can, that's different. This little, white, the this little white sexy powder that's not a drug. Crack is that dirty, dirty yes. drug. But when you see crack, it do look like that dirty little drug. It does. Yeah. Like it literally is like a, like a, a, not a tin on it, but it's like, it doesn't, it's not pure white like the right, movies right, make it right, seem like. Right, like right. It's, it's a little different. Hugh, but she did that because she, um, you know, we talking about the height of like the crack epidemic in America. We're in Detroit where the crack is taking over our whole city. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because of the messaging out there, she had this idea and fear that I'm going to be walking home from school one day or hanging out at the playground or hanging out with some friends and somebody's going to just walk up to me like, want to try some crack? And I'd be like, that sounds good. <laughs> right. But that's not how it was, but the other part of that story, as I tell, the other part of the trauma she was experienced is that she had survived a very violent rape when we moved to Texas, and she was living with this fear of her attacker coming to find her. Because so when she was her. leaving work, there was a man in a van yes. and he had a shotgun. Yes. And, and, uh, he, and he raped her at gunpoint. And he raped her at gunpoint. And even though at that, we had moved back to Detroit, um, uh, at the time when she showed me the crack, the woman next door to us in our apartment got murdered, like literally when we first moved there. Mm -hmm. And so that set off and triggered a PTSD response, which was her turning to drugs. But, but I know you talk a lot in the book about how it affected her, but how was that affecting the young Jamel who's going? Because I found it 
hilarious that you all thought escaping Detroit when she followed the man to Oakland. Like y'all left Detroit to go to Oakland. <laughs> I'm from like, who North, does North that, right? like what y'all did like when you talk about a better life. I'm yeah. like y'all went to Oakland, no shade to the Bay Area, but Oakland you know, has its own reputation. Were you in East Oakland or West Oakland? I mean, I wasn't born in okay, no. but my my mother when my father yes that was no, his. When better. she went, where did she go to? East and she Oakland? went to Oakland, but I don't. You know what? That's a good. Question. If she went to East Oakland, she literally went from <laughs> one fire to another. But when I saw that, I'm thinking, okay, but then you guys end up moving to Houston, so you yeah. moved around a lot. Yeah, a little bit. And, and Houston was more of, the, of probably the promise that, you know, made a little bit more sense coming from Detroit. But, you know, right. the, but things realize that as unlike these other major cities, when the, the epidemics hit harder in Detroit because of the makeup of the city, right, like you're talking right. about like an 80, 90 percent black city, uh, a manufacturing city, a blue collar city. So like when there's a recession. It hit a little different yeah. in Detroit. But when your mom is raped at gunpoint and then she's on prescription drugs and she has all this history of being molested and stuff like that, how is that affecting young Jamel? Um, for me, uh, it was the pain of seeing my mother go through something that I didn't understand. It was not being able to have a normal childhood where I didn't have to have these, you know, sort of adult, very adult concerns. Um, you know, and, and that's what drove me to writing is like I had really no outlet to ex express how I feel, be it my anger, my frustration, my sadness. I didn't have any of that because much like a lot of young black girls I raised uh, is that we're taught to hide and suppress that sadness because we ain't got time to be sad. Mm -hmm. We gotta be out here and survive and figure out how to get on to the next. And so I needed something for me. And that's where journaling, that's where writing, that's where all of that, the, it pushed me to this creative arm that obviously served me quite well throughout the rest of my career, but it, it stemmed from a point of pain. Wait, so the journaling, um, you were writing in the journal. <laughs> I know what you're about no, to say. Because <laughs> I have a journal. Like I started journaling. When I started this show, I started the journaling and I write everything in it. And I'm honest as hell. And I've seen your posts. I've seen your Twitter. I've, seen, I've watched you. Like I know you're brutally honest. I can only imagine you writing in this journal thinking you're talking all this about your mom and then Ooh. she finds the journals and you come in and she's reading it got my ass whooped that didn't work out for you it did not and still top five terrifying feelings in the world and it's not five that i've experienced is like coming home seeing my mother sitting at our dining room table with my journal open yeah. and i was like r.i.p man like wait wait, wait. <laughs> I, I read there's so much i have to go in here i want to find this when you said you wrote, what did you? What did your mother read? You wrote, and what did she say to you? Because she said, "Let me, let me find that. Hold on, because I, because I can recite it if you want." Hold on, hold on. Yeah, go ahead while I look for All it. All right, so I wrote in in there. My mother was having at the time what I considered to be, and I think most people would consider this. So I don't, you know, she was having like a bit of an inappropriate relationship with a very older gentleman, an older white gentleman, and I was. She said she's lucky she's bigger than her. She would drop kick her ass. <laughs> Yes, I said that. And your mama was black. I know. Yeah, this was not going to work out. No, it wasn't. And mm -hmm. so I just know that my mother, as I wrote, like she has, obviously she's a human being. She has two hands. It felt like she had eight. <laughs> and I just got lumped up. And, it, you know, it was funny because when I asked my mother to recall what she remembered of that, um, she told me some stuff that I'm still not quite sure that I believe. Yeah. Like I was talking back to her and that's what made, I was like, mm -mm, I wasn't that kind of child, I don't know. But she lumped me up and she like, you know, she she threw a fireplace, a fake fireplace log at me. But when you were writing in the journal, were you writing all your intimate thoughts and feelings about everything related to your childhood, to school, family, mom? Well, the, the fortunate part is that I still have a few of the journals that I had. Wow. I have the journal that I had when I was like, 11, 12 years old, and I went back and looked at it. I was like, God, you were just an angry, <laughs> brooding, like, uh, who, this, what person would it be fun to be around this person? No, not at all. And so I was able to easily tap into what I was feeling at the time. And it's not like this is very far from my memory anyway. Hmm. Were you ever vulnerable? Because I don't think people look at you and think of vulnerability because you do come across very strong, very passionate, very fearless. Right. And and sometimes I think I am too, but I know that underneath all of what I present, there is some vulnerability. Well, you've had some vulnerable moments, like definitely. Which ones? <laughs> you've had some. You I know. mean, the queen dying was, was that vulnerable? That was unfortunate. But yeah, I mean. You've had some vulnerable moments. Vulnerable to where I think like, 
when I did reality TV and I went That's back. That's what I say. That's oh, when I showed my it. my yeah. family. Yeah, yes, yeah, your yeah, family. Yeah. Like that was yeah. a really powerful, yeah. compelling. Yeah. You know, uh, for you to expose that, that was very brave to do that. Yeah. It's um, it's an emotion I struggle with. Mm -hmm. Like vulnerability is something I struggle with, and and thankfully um, through self awareness, through therapy as well, I've been able to through marriage. To be honest, like. Marriage really forced me into a space of vulnerability I have never been in. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good thing. Sometimes it's frightening. Sometimes I'm like, what the f am I doing? But at the end of the day, it's been very good for me and very good for my growth process. What, what, what was hard about being vulnerable? Well, because I think when you're in survival mode, you just don't have time for it. And a lot of black women, a lot of black girls, you know, there's a reason why there's this perception of us of, of that we're hard or that we're tough. And I get it. Like being called a strong black woman is definitely a compliment. It's meant to be that way. But it denies us vulnerability and delicacy. Like we don't get that. It denies like people think that we should just be there to withstand nonsense all the time. And that's not our function. You know, it, it's sort of I've heard this adage many times before about black women. Um, we're not your mule. Like, that's not our function. Mm -hmm. And yet, that's how we get treated. Like, mules, you know, mules are the workhorses. Mules, you know, are very dependable and reliable. Black women save everybody but themselves. And what I never wanted, what I, I guess this is an epiphany I had as an adult, is like, I'm not going out like Big Mama and Soul Food. Not in the sense of eating badly, but in the sense of this. She, her arm is burning on the stove and she don't even know it. Right. I'm not going out like that. Right. And so I think too many of us are in a position where we don't have spaces where we can cry, where we can tell people I don't have everything figured out, where I'm lost in this, where I'm not feeling it today. We don't have those spaces. And so that was always hard for me to admit because I didn't have the room to to do that. I didn't have the room to fall apart. If Did I you feel like your emotional capacity for being vulnerable was limited because you had to be tough all the time as a kid? Yeah, because I had to, you know, I had this mother going through this um, mental health crisis, really, mm. and that I, you know, I didn't have the space to break down. It was like, no, I got to go out here and get it because if I don't get it, then what's going to happen to me? And that's not to say that she didn't offer me as much protection as she could. She certainly did. My mother would lay her life down for me, mm -hmm. and I have no doubt about that. But at the same time, I had to learn to survive through so many things that I didn't even realize till much, much later in life that, like, I'm out here surviving. I'm not out here living. Mm -hmm. And you feel like the marriage helped you find the tap into the vulnerability? It did. Like, I mean, you know, I've been in... Because you were in that one relationship where <laughs> you were complete opposites. Uh, yeah. And, and, and we knew that <laughs> wasn't going to work. I knew that <laughs> yeah, she was starting to describe it like, Jesus. <laughs> It's not fun to make it. <laughs> so as I read it going on, it was no level of vulnerability that could have happened in that relationship no, to save it. because I... You know I, who I'm talking about. What was his name? Yeah. Um, the, the, you're talking about uh, Larry, who I named, right. you know, a different name, just because it was details I revealed about our relationship yeah. that I realized he may not have revealed to anybody. I don't know what his life is like right. now. And I'm like, I'm not... I haven't talked to him in God knows how long, but I'm not going to do that, uh, you know, to him. But... No, I mean, I would say that was that was a constant struggle in my relationship with men is like learning how to be vulnerable, mostly because I, you know, I don't think I, I trusted it enough. And so my husband was very different because one, he was extremely confident. Um, and he also is somebody when he feels that he says it, I never worried about where I stood with him at all. And that but was... But doesn't that make you both very similar? No, it doesn't. Because really? like the difference with him is like, I have a, a much harder time expressing things that are emotional, even anger. Like, I even have a hard time expressing anger. I know people out really? there watching this are like, what? I'm not the one that goes off. Like, I know it may seem like it, but, but you that know what? I don't, I don't read you as angry. See, they'll say any strong black woman with is an angry. opinion is yes, angry. Correct. I see. I could see them saying that if that's what they think angry looks like. I, I look at that as intelligent, fearless. Um, you know, educated enough to have a conversation with you, but I don't see that as angry. You're right, and it's yeah. like I, if any, if you, any of my close friends will say this, and my husband will certainly say this too, is that like I, I'm a very chill, relaxed person. I don't like to feel angry and out of control because I feel like somebody else has control over me. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm mm -hmm. allowing mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. to do that, 
And like most uh, people, especially, you know, women, it's, it's hard to ask for help. It's hard to admit where you might be insecure about something. It's hard to admit where you feel like you're failing at something. And those are all things that were very hard for me mm -hmm. to admit because I was like, no, nah, I got to hold this down mm -hmm. regardless. Mm -hmm. And so my husband was really the first man I ever dated where I didn't feel like I had to hold it down alone mm -hmm. is that he you know, just through little things, let me know that like, no, nah, I got you. And mm. I was like, okay, that thawed me, you know, big time. And marriage, you understand, at least this is my view of it. I know everybody may think differently. Marriage is, marriage is a mirror, not a reflection. Okay. It's, it's, it's a mirror because it's things that you do when you single that and even under the dynamics of being in what you think are long term relationships or whatever, it's things that you do in that space that do not work in marriage. Right. Right. Because like when you're just in a relationship with somebody and you may even love them when you argue, a lot of times you arguing to win. Right. You you arguing to maybe humiliate the other person, mm -hmm. maybe like, yo, I, I'm going to show you mm -hmm. yeah, marriage. You're going to sleep with this. Every night. Right. You can't argue that way. You have to argue with the spirit of resolution. Mm -hmm. So. And the other person, especially if you marry the right person, they will call you out on your Okay, so you're, this is the other thing I have, I guess, not an issue with marriage, but I'm trying to resolve through therapy mm -hmm. is being with one person for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So when you're Jamil Hill, respected broadcast journalist, uh -huh. um, educated, you get with this man, you're married. What if y'all want to do some freaky shit on the side? You can never get away with that because you'll be on Hollywood Unlocked or Shade Room or something. She's not gonna talk about it. <laughs> well, no, she what, just told no, us no, everything what, we need to know. This is what I will say. <laughs> all right, I think within the confines of whatever type of relationship works for you, right? If y'all want to get out there, I ain't shaming nobody over right, any kink right. or whatever. I mean, yes, you do have to move differently yeah. when you have a name, but to me, if this is the last person that you gonna the rest of your life, right. you got to make sure for both of you that you're satisfied. That you're satisfied, right. correct? But one thing that's always been helpful for me is the fact that I was always the kind of person, like when I'm in a, on a, in a relationship, I never worry about the things I didn't do because I did them right. when I was single right. and I'm fine. Right. Like there's a lot of people that get in relationships and they haven't done the thing when they're single. That's mm -hmm. why I always tell, like I used to tell some of my girlfriends, this is mostly when I was in my twenties, was like, y'all need to date like a man right. because honestly, you know, what's going to happen is like you may get in some relationship and you will be thinking about all the things that you have missed out on. There are everybody has different boundaries when you're in a in a marriage in particular. But what I have definitely learned, especially, um, you know, I don't know how it happens, but you, you, you do wind up being friends with more married couples. And if you have good enough relationships where y'all can be like real and honest, you really do find out that. You know, not only is everybody's marriage differently, but how you tailor it is differently. So, if, you know, there are people that have open marriages. Mm -hmm. And if that works for you and everybody can handle it and everybody's on the same page and the boundaries are there, then do that. Mm -hmm. Right. But if it doesn't work for you and maybe the other person wants to try it, well, that's something that y'all going to have to address when it comes to just like how y'all get down. I mean, I. I pretty much think that like everything's on the table. But when you're a public figure, you also have to be mindful and they have to yeah, be mindful you have to be because careful, then it gets sloppy. You do have to be careful. You can't be out here reckless and wild. But what I will say is that like me and my husband have such a good relationship and a good friendship on top of that and a good level of honesty where, um, you know, we've often said with like hypotheticals, like, hey, you know, if you ever feel the need, like, you know, I really, I want to cheat. Or I'm feeling some some kind of feelings for somebody. I need not, a hall pass. I, well, whatever. Yeah. I was like, you can you can tell me what that is, and like, and vice versa. It's like you can tell me if that's if that's really how you feel, because I'd rather us talk about it and us discuss it and come to some kind of consensus and compromise or whatever that looks like for us. I'd rather us do that than you go out here and do some wild shit or me go out here and do some wild. Shit and it winds up impacting how we see each other, mm. and really our marriage. Mm. It's the honesty and the communication part that works. So, you know, I feel like we've been really extremely honest about, um, you know, how we would approach certain um, situations and dynamics if we if we got to that. But I think that's what keeps the relationship healthy. Mm -hmm. Do you also treat it because you are so focused on business? I'm not sure what industry he's in. Do you all work as a, as a business too? Because I feel like 
one of my relationships we were in, we would get up early in the morning, have meetings about what we want to do, how oh, we're going to wow. do it, how we're going to move. And we were able to build. Okay. It's just ultimately they they didn't have the emotional capacity to be in love for an ever type thing. And oh. I was ready to build Hollywood Unlocked, so I left. But do you all meet? And talk like as a business too. As so much as- we do like we have sort of two things we're working on. We do have a business together in the sense that um, you know there's a merchandising arm to Jamel Hills and Bother in my podcast, and you know JamelStore.com. That's where it is. So Jamel Merchandise is there, and it's honestly it was his idea. It was not my idea at all. Like I'm a singular creative. Like I write, I talk, I podcast, I talk. <laughs> TV, mm-hmm. that's what I do. And so he was like, you know, you need to really create some merchandise and create some other branding things around yourself. These were his ideas. Again, that's why you with a partner that can level you up. And so I was like, you know what? I'll, you are in charge of that. Cause like, I don't know if I have the bandwidth, mm-hmm. but we wound up collaborating together and he came up with some great ideas. Like he's really good at marketing. And so, so yeah, so then that was that part. And then uh, because he used to do, he used to do radio that, He's also very good on camera. And mm-hmm. I told him, I was like, you're very good on camera. And now we started this sort of YouTube series that we do that's on my YouTube page called Conversations on Vacation. Because between it. the two of us, like he's been to 40 countries. I've oh, been wow. to like 37. I you guys think. just went to India. We just went to India. I mean, we've been a bunch of places. And so what would happen on our vacations that we've been on together is like we would get into these awesome deep conversations, thanks to you, you just gave me one, like, okay, <laughs> about, you know, what what that sex life looks like in a marriage in terms of like, hey, if somebody is like, yo, want to bring in a third or whatever, mm-hmm. like, I was like, mm, we might have to have that conversation. Well, if you little- really want a content idea, I think you find the third in these countries that you travel to. And the <laughs> have us all, all have, see, yes. See, you now, I'll tell you, that, that right there, I'm subscribing <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Sponsored by OnlyFans. That's all I'm about to say. I was like, we got to get a sponsor for that. We can't give oh, that I'll one call away for free. from OnlyFans right now. No. <laughs> we can't give that away for free. But I think that's amazing, though. Yeah. So we, um, you know, so we've been, we've done a series of these. We did one from Bora Bora. We did one from Vegas, like all over mm. the world. And that's something, because I think ultimately what we would love to angle for is to do a, a travel show together. And, you know, I think, I mean, as crazy as it may sound, I, I don't think we'd say no to reality TV. Mm. Yeah, which would be really interesting. Interesting. Mm. But how does, okay, so let's, we talk about relationships. I have to go back to one because mm. you were very open about a relationship you had early on and you got pregnant and yep. then decided to have an abortion. Correct. First question is, does your husband now know everything that was in the book before the book was published? He knew about that and he knew about the relationship. He knew all the broad strokes. But there were detailed incidents that I don't think I I ever told him. And not because I was trying to hide it. It's just that I don't know how it comes up when you're like, oh, let me tell you about that time that, you know, my father had a heroin needle in his arm when he was holding me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's like some of it has got to come up organically. But he read a very, very early version of it. And, you know, he, I was like, I want to make sure that you read it. I want to uh, make sure that you, I, I'm considering how you might feel about anything that's in there. And so that we can discuss it. And he was so supportive, you know, very proud of me for laying it out there. He's like, I can't believe you told all of this. Mm-hmm. And I think reading that helped him understand me better. Um, and, you know, I, I think that is, I, I hate to sound like, like some kind of marriage cheerleader, but I do think that's one of the benefits of marriage is that like you're constantly learning about the person every single day. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just, you know, when things happen, it's like every day I learn something new, like, oh, I did not know that he liked his corn that way. Right. Like who knew, right? And so it was very important to me, the two most important people to me to, to sort of, that I needed to show this before it was published was my mother and him. Mm. Those are the two most important people. But to know how strong you are and the courage to write about having an abortion, especially yeah. in the time where legislators, you know, all these white men are out voting mm-hmm. against women having control over their bodies. Yes. Um, Although so- the climate, I hate to say it, it was better then than now. It was better in then. terms of the conversation. Oh yeah, no, like, no, yeah. Then it was but like but the reason why I bring yeah. it up now is because the climate now is it's just crazy. It's now. terrible. Yeah. But when you talk about the abortion, most of the times where people are debating the right for a woman to have abortion, it's like, oh, what if she's molested or what if she's raped or what? If, you just decided you mm-hmm. did not want to have a child. And right. was that because your career? You were so focused on your career. It was twofold: career focus, person focus, mm-hmm. as in the person that impregnated me. Yeah. Um, we had a very rocky relationship. 
Uh, wasn't sure that was going to work. Knew it was not going to be long term. Knew marriage wasn't in our future. And, um, you know, we were kind of on the verge of a breakup at that point, uh, at least in my eyes. Like, I don't know how he looked at it. But for me, I was like, I don't think this is going to this ain't going to this ain't going to last another couple months. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I did not want to be tied to somebody for the rest of my life um, like that. Mm -hmm. I didn't. And I also was never the the girl who wanted children. Like I was never somebody who was just like, oh, I gotta have some kids. That was never me. So it was, and I, I'm glad I wrote about it from the perspective that I did because as you said, it's always written about from a trauma standpoint. Some, you know, well, first it, of all, I don't think it needs to be an explanation. Me that, that, The yeah, craziest right. part is you're right. that we even have to explain why Correct. a woman wants to, you know, cause I'm a man. No. I don't have to explain. Right. So I don't know why I I'm, I have five sisters. I just do not know why women have to explain why they arrived at a decision that affects them. But I explained it the way I did because I did want to shift the conversation for it being abortion being beyond a trauma response. Some some women just decide to do it because they don't want any kids, mm -hmm. and this is not this is not fitting their life. And you could judge me for it. I know people did. Like I got a bunch of crazy responses of people saying like. You a baby killer. When and, they read the book? Oh, yeah. like mm -hmm. uh, Because even um, before the book was actually published, uh, The Atlantic ran an excerpt from the book. I did an adapted excerpt for them right around the time the Supreme Court basically undercut cut Roe because I knew this was coming out in the book. And I was like, no, it's important for me to talk about this now. And I, I wanted it to represent a, a different perspective. It's like women deserve the right to choose just cause. Mm -hmm. Like there is no but just because. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to go through some incident. It doesn't have to be we about to die um, in childbirth. None of that. Like we just deserve that right, period. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I, it was probably 50-50 negative to positive because it was like a lot of people who called me selfish, called me arrogant, said I was a baby killer, all the normal stuff. You know, the crazy part I, I don't think is. people get about people like you and me is that our job is to get you to talk. <laughs> Whether it's good or bad, <laughs> right. it's just to get you to talk. Right. So how do you, as somebody who grew up voiceless, who probably felt voiceless, felt like you weren't seen, become somebody so visible and so hurt? I think it's because I felt like I didn't have a voice and I didn't have a say that I'm so adamant and passionate and dig into it now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't dig into it in a way... Uh, that is, you know, sort of aimless. It's like I dig into a way that I hope is purposeful. It's like, you know, growing up when you feel like, you know, when you're growing up in the circumstances I did and you feel like you have no control or say so, or even, you know, some of the abuse that I just suffered, like, you know, from my mother at the time, where like that spirit and voice where I felt like was really taken away. It's like now it's, it's nothing you could do to take that away from me. So I don't, Listen, you get to a point after a while, maybe it doesn't start this way early in your career, maybe it wasn't this way for you early in your career, where you, you sort of grow into the strength of it. Like, there are things that could have been said to me in my 20s, be it personally or professionally, that would bother me, that now I'm just like, oh, I don't even care. Like, I, I was like, I, I really don't, so. But where does that courage come from? Because even in, as you were, See, when I look at your career, when I look at my career and what I've decided to do, like I don't know how to work for anybody else because I feel like they yeah. try to control you. When you've when in your career, when you wrote the piece and you referenced Hitler and they came after you in a different way, they came after one of your other colleagues. Right. Didn't you start to see early on how that ecosystem of the world that kind of controls media and things, just if you don't fall in line with a thought or theory or if you step outside, especially being black, and then on top of that being a female. Like, we'll slap you on your hand or you'll be consequence or you can lose everything. So I think it was uh, my awakening in that area was a little different because I'd always been a part of legacy media, right? Mm -hmm. That was where, that was the only thing I knew. I'd only worked for newspapers that were owned by major companies and corporations or families. Uh, I worked at ESPN, obviously owned by Disney. And so there was, there are certain bargains that you make when you do that. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to take those bargains and I was willing to make those concessions until I wasn't. And the big time when I wasn't was Donald Trump, mm -hmm. right? And it's like once that happened is when I officially decided, I was like, I would never put myself in that position again. Mm -hmm. um, I will work with people. I think I'm past working for people. Mm -hmm. And um, so everything is much more collaborative. 
the jobs and the responsibilities that I have and the projects I'm working for, I can walk away from any one of them. Uh, they're all jobs I want and not jobs I need. And so because of that, I have a much more powerful mindset than I have at any other point in my career. But again, that's something you have to grow into it. Like you got onto it early. Mm -hmm. It took that moment for me to realize, like I, I knew any place I ever worked for in legacy corporate media, it's a conditional relationship. I mean, they want you. They, they yeah. want your intelligence. They yeah. want your fearlessness. They want the spice and they want all that. They want you to do it. But don't don't piss off to this person. To a point. Yeah, to a point. And the problem is that point is always a moving goalpost. But they don't realize when you're building that fearlessness voice, you're building an audience that expects you to be fearless all the time. So mm -hmm. when you pick and choose when you're fearless, they know. Yeah. You no, know? they... and Well... They're basing everything that they're basing everything off reaction. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just being me, and they're just like, okay, if if they react good, then we're good. But if they react bad, then okay, we're not good. So that's why I said it's like a floating goalpost, like all the time, and that's tiresome. Like I, you know, I I just got really tired of that, and uh, even after that, in working with you know, say a Spotify or you know, when I worked with uh, CNN Plus, even those are big legacy sort of media corporations we had an understanding. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were getting mm -hmm. because you see my history, so you already know it. So if you sign yourself up with me now expecting something different, then you just trying to torture yourself mm -hmm. because I'm not changing and I'm letting you know that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to have an understanding. So the Donald Trump um, era of um, the White House, mm -hmm. when you look back on it now having come out of it, what do you say? Because <laughs> <laughs> you said a lot on Twitter, which we'll get to, but when you look back now, and we've come out of because you've been through a lot of trauma. That was traumatic. <laughs> when you look at it, what do you what do you think? Now um, I'm grateful for the ignorance, and by that I mean I'm grateful that I was ignorant to what I was doing in the moment. <laughs> because if I actually had time to think about it, I might have talked myself out of it. Like, what are you doing sending this tweet? Really? Uh, I think so. I, I think because I didn't really honestly think it was a big deal. You know, calling especially now these days calling. White uh, calling Donald Trump a white supremacist is like saying this is De Leon. Right. Like it's it's nothing. But right. then that wasn't the case, right? Because he was the president. Because he was the president, and because I think the media in particular was very slow to call a sitting president. Let, let me let me set this up. Okay, okay. so Jamil was um, over there. Run I'd say he was running things at ESPN. You were <laughs> co-hosting the biggest show on the network, right? right. Sports Center. You tweet. We were going through a, a four years of. I don't even know how many years it was at the uh, time. No, at this, this point, was it was year. It was year one. This was the beginning. Yes. So the beginning of yeah. Donald Trump's presidency. We've all seen how it's unfolded. Some <laughs> could say she was a genie because she was able to tell the the past, whatever. But um, she said Donald Trump is a white supremacist who has largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. Trump is the most ignorant, offensive president in my lifetime. His rise is a direct result of white supremacy. And you went on to say how he was unqualified and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you knew your voice was loud at the time. Yeah. And you knew that you had a following that was waiting. I mean, you had over, I think, a million followers at the time. No, right? I didn't. You, you, Oh, you got him through this tweet. I did. But, at the, but I did have a six-figure following. You had a large following. I had a large following, okay. yes. But you grew more, which means that Correct. people were paying attention. And so these, these uh, tweets set off a fire that it seemed like it was burning the house down. Um... Even when you left and thought you wasn't supposed to come back and you were called to come back, which I thought was petty and funny. I wouldn't have came back, by the way. Um, did you, you didn't think at the time it was going to light the internet on fire like that? No, I did not because there was a reply tweet. There wasn't like, I, it wasn't like I tweeted, <laughs> at Donald Trump, you are white supremacist. Right. Like it wasn't that. I was in an argument right. with a Twitter follower who was providing way too much cover in defense of Donald Trump. And I never expected those tweets to take off the way they did. That's why I said, if I'm thankful for anything, it's ignorance. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, who's combing through my replies? Right. Apparently a lot of people, <laughs> they did that. And, uh, you know, once it started sort of rolling downhill to the point of where, you know, the White House press secretary at the time, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Who is, I thought was also a racist. Oh, I don't think there's any question. Right? She's now governor of Arkansas. Crazy. Yeah, and she's... Insane. Insane. And she so would literally get up there every day and tell us a lie oh, totally. to the whole world mm -hmm. and then make us feel guilty for calling it a lie. Right. And then and now she's on her way to ruining the, the state of Arkansas. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, to, to hear your name come up in a White House press briefing is, is surreal. And it just, it was just an avalanche, mm -hmm. just a total avalanche. I was very unprepared for it. 
this is going to sound strange. I was unprepared for it, but I was built for it. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, I didn't expect that to be the response. But at the same time, I realized at some point, very early, I was like, this moment is something I've been kind of created for. Mm -hmm. uh, because I wasn't gonna back down. I wasn't gonna change my opinion. ESPN asked me if I would take it back. And I said, no, I would not take it back. I was like, the, the, at the least I'll do is I'll apologize for something I'm actually really sorry for. It's like, I'm sorry that my coworkers who I, love and respect that I put them in a position to where now people are asking them questions about me and what about what I said and they have to answer for whether or not their views align with mine. Like I feel sorry for putting them in that position. The people that I respect at this company. Because Michael was just out there by himself. Uh, yeah, but Michael was my dog, right. and he was riding with me. Was he calling you like, girl? No, not at, not girl, at all. You done, you done blew up the internet. And, uh, no, he wasn't. He was just like, all right, we both feel that way. <laughs> like, I mean, he, but he he recognized the gravity of the moment for sure. But um, you know, he stood in full solidarity. So when they sent me home, he was just like, I ain't trying to do the show either, mm -hmm. right? Because he never wanted it to look like. Um, and, you know, I guess to give your, uh, you know, viewers like some backstory is that the day that this all came to the head, came to a head, you know, they essentially the president of ESPN at, at the time, um, John Skipper, you know, he I went to his office to have a meeting about this and he told me he thought it would be best if I went home for that day and didn't do the show that night. But and, then later he tried to act like he didn't tell you that. Well, see, that's the coward. I don't like so this. Why I, I could never like you sent me home I'm out. Then you went and got drunk. She went and found the daily. I didn't get drunk. Well, she didn't oh, get, yeah. she didn't I get did, drunk. I did she not get drunk. Back on air later. We'll talk about I that. I was I was back on air. Okay. She was sipping slow. I, I sipped slow. Luckily, they melt. My ice melted, and so <laughs> it was like in my tequila, and I was like I didn't even get a chance. But why weren't you petty? At some point, don't you feel like you deserve to be petty and say no? Y'all playing in my face. You playing with the audience. You know you need me, so I'm. No, I'm about to sip this drink and good luck. So here's the thing. Sometimes, especially, and maybe this is just corporate warfare that I picked up. And, and by the way, the, the, the interesting punchline is, is that me and John Skipper work together now. And I, oh, wow. I, I've always considered him to be a champion of mine. I, we had a very bad moment, okay? and That day. That day, we had a very bad moment. And um, when he read the book, he told me something that was very kind. He was a, he told me, I'm getting this verbatim, he said, you were kinder to me than I deserved. Mm. And um, because my whole career there, like he had been in my corner. And so that's why I was so shocked at him saying that to me. At any rate, this is the reason I didn't choose to be petty. You gotta play the longest game sometime. And what I found at, at corporations, is that what helps you create leverage is instances like that. I did y'all a solid. Best believe when it was time for me to leave, that was brought up mm -hmm. because I wanted to leave with my money, mm -hmm. all right? And I left with my money because there was all these things that my agent could point out and be like, okay, remember when she did you a solid with this? And you're right, like when that story first came out about them sending me home, ESPN didn't give a denial necessarily. And I evaded the questions because I was asked about it, especially because they tried to replace Mike and I um, with two black hosts, two other black hosts who worked at ESPN. Um, you know, there was a certain uh, game of, of, of word mixing that definitely went on. And, you know, me and my agent talked about it. I was like, I'm going to do them this favor because trust me, I'm going to cash this in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to drop this big joker. <laughs> Believe that. Mm -hmm. Right? And so sometimes you have to play that game so you ultimately could get what you want. So the easiest check, one of the easiest checks ESPN ever wrote was to me. That's one of the easiest checks they wrote because they knew and it was partly why it was an amicable parting is that there were certain moments that happened throughout that where we had a understanding, never spoken aloud, that like, you, you don't do me fully dirty, I won't do you fully dirty. Because we all know this is coming to a head. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to play that game to ultimately get what you want to get out of there. How did it later came, come up that Michael was making $200,000 more than you were? Oh, so were that came you? up. And this is not referring to when we were on Sports Center. On Sports Center, we were making the exact same. Okay. Um, when I first started at, with Numbers Never Lie. And, you know, Mike had already been an established host. I was not an established host. But we were going to be doing the same job. And, and 200000 is a huge gap. 
pretty big gap, yeah, but you know, and th- and this is what I tell people in, uh, especially men too. If you if you work alongside a woman and y'all have similar positions, I think people period like don't be afraid to tell your salary mm-hmm. because like they count on the silence. Like they don't want you to know what the next person is making because then you'll demand more. And so, um, even though the salary bump that I got was like a good, it was like a good fifty percent bump from where I was before. It was a great bump for me, but it was, especially as the show got successful and I locked into this contract, I was like, wow, like this is the discrepancy. But he but he was very honest. You know, Mike was like, hey, sis, I'm just telling you, this is where I am, this is what my number is, you know, whatever, whatever. And we actually eventually at one point we had the same agent. We don't mm-hmm. now, but like at one point that we did. And I think because of our uh collective negotiating power together. Uh, it was able to balance out some inequities. So the other tweets that you got in trouble for um, or that you got called out for were the Jerry Jones tweets. Yep. And then when you tweeted about him and you said, um, well, well, he said that if there were any players who would take a knee that he would bench them or whatever. And mm-hmm. you said that this this play always works. Change happens when advertisers are impacted. And you said, uh, if you feel strongly about JJ's statement, boycott, boycott his advertisers, which I think is powerful because that's where you hit people is where the money is. People were mad, drug you for that. Um, and then people said, they said that you violated the policies again. Yeah. But then years later, we see this photo now with Jerry Jones, right? With, where he, they were trying to get all the black kids kicked out to school. And he's right there like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, there was a, so, a video that went viral where he stopped a black person from being kicked out of the arena. Where it's, I mean, it's like, people. why do people have a short attention span? on both the history of racism, how it's embedded in corporate society and in sports and other things that's mainstream, and then are so quick to forgive and just move on. So here's here's where that sort of original tweet came from. And this was, this was after Donald Trump had called the NFL players. Mm-hmm. He called them out. And he tried to embarrass... And basically said they shouldn't be playing for yeah, any team. Yeah, he said, that fire them. Yeah. You know, even though he's friends with a lot of NFL owners. And he's a sitting president. And he's a sitting president. Like, what are you doing? We got more important stuff to worry about. So he shames the NFL. And Jerry Jones is a a friend of Donald Trump's. Jerry Jones gave over $2 million to his campaign. And, you know, for a moment, the NFL was in solidarity where they locked arms and did all that performative after Trump said that to say, we are together. And then right after that, Jerry Jones says, any of my players take a knee, they're going to get cut or, you know, they're not or they're going to get benched. Same dude that signed Greg Hardy. Greg Hardy, the one who um, was convicted of domestic violence and got overturned on a bench trial. But during, you know, in terms of what he did to his then girlfriend at the time, I mean, he choked this woman in a bathtub. All right. And tried to kill her. Mm-hmm. You signed him and didn't blink. Didn't blink. But somebody who decides, like, you know, maybe I want to take a knee or do some kind of gesture to bring attention to racial injustice, oppression, you think that person is worthy of being benched. And it, it's like, okay. And so there was a lot of hypocrisy, obviously, in that. The fans were like, oh, especially black fans. I'm gonna be very specific. It was black fans who were calling out black Dallas Cowboys players and saying, how could y'all play for this? Basically calling them a plantation owner. Y'all play for him, y'all need to take a stand. And what sometimes does upset me is that Fans, and I will apply this to our culture in general, they want all the people in high profile position to take all the risk and they don't want to do anything. And I'm not saying that, look, I get it to whom much is given, much is required. Totally understand that. But don't sit there and say these record labels treat artists terrible and you buying every record they put out. Right. Don't sit there and say, oh, you know, Hollywood is just so racist and why don't they give Viola Davis her due? when you watch every Academy Awards, when you go to, and you support all this stuff, you want all the people who are in the high profile positions to take all the risk. Mm -hmm. When you're the consumer, you're the most powerful person. It's not the people that are in our positions, it's you. Because you can actually cost them money. And so that was the point of that tweet by saying like, if y'all really hate the NFL for how they treated Colin Kaepernick and what Jerry Jones said, stop watching. Mm -hmm. Nobody's forcing you to watch the NFL, but y'all don't want to do that. But you want Dak Prescott to forego his million dollar salary. But that was the gotcha because 
ESPN and NFL's relationship. Yes, it's right. a billion dollar relationship. So as soon as I said that, it was like, ding. That was it. And I got it. And I, I even said this. At Did the you know you were going to get it when you said it? No, I didn't. <laughs> Once again, ignorance is my friend. Do you feel like you were a great journalist for them, but you were too black? Like too pro-black? Because when I hear you talk about the sport and I hear you talk about the love and passion for reporting, and I also hear the pride in being black. So do you think it was just too black for, AB, like for Disney? I think this is something that unfortunately... Because look what they did to Whoopi. Well, well, you know what? What I'll say is this. Is whenever you have a strong black voice, whether you agree with that black voice or not, is a lot of companies, they want this, they don't want this. That's different, right? And so um, I think there's... I think a lot of times in corporate America, because you have mostly white decision makers, they're only willing to go so far. And they don't know that when you have a black person, woman or man, in a position of influence with a strong point of view, you got to have the stomach for the fight. And they don't have the stomach. Mm. So I happened to my girl, Tiffany Cross, okay? Uh, obviously, I've experienced that. There's so many of us across the industry that have experienced this, is that they want you to bring in the people that look like you, but... If it come, if the decision ever comes between what you have to say, even if it's totally right, versus the white people they may piss off, they're choosing the white people every time. Facts. And that's why I said the new slavery is the brands need the black folks in the culture to make the brands hot so they get the black folks. Then the black folks bring in all the black folks to buy into it. And then if there's anything that creates any challenge, then they want the black folks to speak that narrative and follow that narrative that they've said. So you're almost slave to that. And then the minute you walk outside the lines, you're done. Which is why we can't be so eager to give up the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I get it. I understand how the system works, is that the, the payoff comes with aligning with them, with partnering with them. Like, I totally get that. You know, I'll use Jay-Z as I was, a, you were, Am I reading your mind? I was waiting for the I moment know. to put in that because I just went to the in, to the Super Bowl. Mm. And when I was sitting there, I was looking at, it was every rapper I could think of, every actor, I mean, everybody black, it was black. And I saw on the field little words, in racism, I don't know, whatever. Uh, and I met Roger Goodall the night before, and I wanted to walk up to him to say, I see what you're doing, <laughs> right? But He knew what he was doing. But when you look at that partnership with Jay-Z in the NFL, yeah. what do you think? So I, um, it was, I didn't love it, you know. I mean, I was critical of it, uh, obviously. I have a lot of respect for Jay-Z. I know what he's done for culture. This is, and you know, I, I feel like I always have to qualify because I know how dearly our culture holds him, as they should, and respect and reverence to him, and obviously Beyonce too. And I know, I know what he was probably thinking. Mm -hmm. But you're dealing with a different group of people here in the sense of like, they needed the access to the culture. Like he, Jay-Z knew that. That's why I said the Super Bowl need me, I don't need them. Mm -hmm. They need us. Mm -hmm. That Super Bowl halftime show was on life support. Mm -hmm. Nobody was with that show at all. And as soon as he aligned, he gave them access to something they didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. And that was my issue with it. And I get it, you can, th listen, I, I understand there's gonna be an argument to say, okay, he gave them access, but at the same time, Rihanna doesn't have to drop an album and like, you see how her <laughs> them streams like murdered it. I enjoyed the performance. I love the fact that Mary J. Blige and Dr. Dre and, and 50 and all of them, hip hop got a stage. Eminem too. Eminem too. Mm -hmm. Hip hop got a stage at the biggest sporting event in America that it has always been. Tap deserved. dance for slave owners for years. Uh, yes, you can say that for sure. But I, I get sometimes our struggle between getting what we deserved and selling out for what we deserve. Mm -hmm. It's a fine line. So do you think it would have it would have changed things had Jay-Z said, but Colin Kaepernick needs to be playing? No, I don't know if Jay-Z could have made that call necessarily because we're talking about like Jay-Z is power beyond measure, but he ain't gonna tell 30 white men billionaires what to do. Right. It's not gonna, they're not gonna do it because- Because even with all that power, they're still not gonna respect They're dug in. As, yeah. They resent Colin. Yeah. They hate Colin. Mm -hmm. They're like never, they're, it, 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 
on their dying breath, they're not going to let this man back in the league because they feel like he stepped outside of an order that they felt like they had explicitly established, mm -hmm. right? The order of conformity. And no, they're, they, that's unforgivable to them. And But isn't almost the action of them all banning arms against Trump to show some solidarity similar to the black men who wanted to take a knee? I mean, well, couldn't it have been? It's like... Well, the difference is, like, I don't think their show in solidarity was... I think it was just performative. Mm -hmm. It wasn't real because uh, a cluster of them all d donated to his campaign. Like, so it's like, it's not really real. Mm -hmm. Like, Jerry Jones, he did that locking arms nearly before the cameras rolled. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that's what I'm talking about. Stephen Ross, owner of the Dolphins, how much money he's given to Trump and, like, that he's raised for him. He's raised like $20 million for this dude. Mm. Like, it's all a show, right. right? The NFL acts racist. They don't want to look racist. Mm -hmm. That's the difference, mm. okay? And so, you know, when Jay-Z aligned with him, it was just very uncomfortable because at the same time, I love black artistry and excellence celebrated. And hip-hop, again, deserved that stage. Black people deserve that stage because we're the, we're the epicenter of music. But I, I wonder, it's like, was it worth it? You know, it's worth it for the individual artists that were able to, you know, without doing anything, like Mary gets a Pepsi tour out of it. Like, yes, it does work individually. Does it work collectively and community based? Does it work? Mm. And sometimes we give access to our culture that they don't deserve. Mm. And I don't think we give it up easily, but I think we give it up all with the same game plan. We'll be like, oh, yeah, we'll do it because we can change the system from within. And I don't know if that's always true. Mm. I think it needs both. Mm. Inside pressure, outside pressure. Rachel Nichols. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> she got fired from ESPN. <laughs> now, um, for people who may have missed this, because again, I don't watch every single thing on Twitter. I got to do some research and start digging and finding the tea. So she basically was on the Zoom where they were talking about a gig or mm -hmm. talking about having, having the Zoom. A Zoom that was being recorded that she didn't know was being... Recorded. Yeah. But when she, when everybody clicked out, she didn't click out, but it was still being recorded. It was still being recorded. Somebody recorded it or somebody went out and spoke about what she said. Yeah. And somebody she, heard it. And, and in her contract, she was supposed to cover something that she said she believed was going to, she was going to be replaced by a black girl. Right. Right. By Maria Taylor. By Maria Taylor. Well, that, that person then went and reported on it and then she got fired and then they replaced her with a black woman. Mm -hmm. Was that performative or was that accountability or was that strategically because they wanted to put a black face out there to report on that event. So, yeah, I mean, listen, I, I thought it did a disservice to a lot of people. One, Maria Taylor's excellent. I mean, she's one of the best in the business and deserved to have that position. The problem was that, and I don't agree with some of the things that Rachel said that were caught on that Zoom. I think, I thought there was a few moments where I felt like she really denigrated Maria's talent. I under, but I understood why Rachel was upset mm -hmm. because, as you know, being in this business, and I know explicitly, like when you're in these contracts with these networks, there are things you get promised that are in your contract mm -hmm. that you're going to hold them to. Mm -hmm. It was in her contract mm -hmm. for her to do the finals. So naturally, she was going to be upset. But what was distasteful is that she made it seem like the only reason Maria could have possibly have gotten a opportunity like that was because she was black. And, you know, I, I've known Rachel for years. And I knew Rachel when she was a writer at the Washington Post. Like, not knew her personally, but knew that's her, her, her background. And got to know her at ESPN, have no problem with her. She's one of the best reporters in both the NFL and the NBA, very well respected. I thought that was a very bad moment for her, but I thought it was a worse moment for ESPN. And it happens to women, it happens to black people, people of color, period, is these corporations play us off each other. Mm -hmm. You know, make us think that we're fighting for crumbs over things that everybody actually deserves. Mm -hmm. So if ESPN was feeling some kind of pressure to put a black woman in the chair of, of hosting the finals, then that's something that they should have dealt with before then. Mm -hmm. Why are you putting two women in this position mm -hmm to fight with each other. Where well, then it becomes about race and it distracts Correct. you from the real from the issue. real purpose. The real purpose is that like, y'all should have really found a way to use them both, <laughs> okay? Right. Or, or to frankly handle this much more professionally than you did, than to, to let everybody 
suddenly be exposed to this, what should have been handled internally. Rachel went on the All the Smoke podcast. She said, this was a conversation between me and a friend. We talked about a lot of things. He brought up the article that had been in the paper about the lack of opportunities for people of color at ESPN. And we started talking about how my situation may intersect with some of the race and gender history of a network that is well-documented and complicated. I mean, it, it was, it, it's very true that ESPN, like a lot of corporations, has struggled in, um, in terms of how they treat women and how they treat people of color, how they treat black people uh, in, in particular. And so ultimately, I felt like the real culprit, which is the company, did not get the level of criticism that they should have gotten. Mm -hmm. So... You're good friends with Bob Iger. You were cool with him. Yeah, I'm cool with Bob. Mm -hmm. So you talk about I Bob. I say good friends. Let's, I mean, not, let's not stretch this out too far. <laughs> the way, I don't know Bob. I mean, I'm assuming he's he's like the god of Disney. He's Avis, like, I mean, some people would say like he's easily top five most powerful people in Hollywood. Period. Period. I saw recently they honored him on The View. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, when you went to talk about the Donald Trump tweets, mm -hmm. was he... Did you feel like he was talking to as a friend to try to figure out what to do, or he was talking to as a friend because he needed to take care of business and hold you accountable? Because oh. him and Donald Trump were friends, right? No. They're not friends. No, not that I know of. Oh, no. Him and um, Barack Obama are friends. Him and Barack are friends. We're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so so the, him and Donald Trump are, like, there was a long time, there was this uh, rumor that Bob Iger may one day run for president as a Democrat. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, as a Democrat, mm -hmm. not as a, as a Republican. He's generally considered to be, I wouldn't necessarily call him liberal, but considered to be, if you want to take a red versus blue, on the blue side. Yeah. And after my suspension, uh, Bob Iger and I met. I was really surprised that I was, for a long time, I was the only ESPN personality that Bob Iger followed on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's good or bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he and I had met a, a few times. He had to he, see what them tweets was all about. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but this is before Donald Trump. I was the, the But only... you were still very vocal on Twitter. Yeah, I was yeah, I was yeah. still vocal, but vocal within the confines yeah, of their yeah. social media policy. So it was a, a little did bit. Did you read the social media policy? I did. <laughs> you just didn't care. I mean, I we just all get, felt I just like gave my I whole staff. So I just gave my staff policies. They, <laughs> they don't keep these policies. We just throw them away. Like, okay, we got I it. I just, I felt like I could, you know, sort of <laughs> play fast and loose with a, yeah. a, a few of them or whatever. But generally, I tried to respect it. Um, but no, I mean, Bob Iger, this was obviously a big issue for him because once the Trump thing blew up, I mean, he's being asked about it at shareholders meeting. It was shareholders that were that were pissed, mm -hmm. you know, frankly. And one shareholder in particular, I don't know who it is, like asked him, why wasn't I fired? Mm. And he defended me publicly, which I, I really appreciated. But when we finally met and we met, actually, it was right before Black Panther uh, premiered. Um, and in terms of for the larger audience, it had already done the Hollywood premiere. And we spent the first part of the conversation talking about Black Panther because uh, I told him, I was like, this is about to be a cultural moment, mm -hmm. like for sure. At any rate, um, you know, he he was very upfront, and matter of fact, and he said, no, you deserve to be suspended. And I, he didn't offer an apology. I didn't ask for one because I didn't expect one. But I felt like we had to clear the air in the sense like I was still working at ESPN, you know, so this is 2018, still working there. I have to figure out what the rest of my time looks like. I don't want the president of the company to be um, somebody who I'm in the crosshairs of, we've had a very cordial relationship to that point. And I was kind of surprised that when I asked to meet with him, he immediately was like, yes, let's meet, let's make sure we meet. Because mm -hmm. if, if I'm going to be the number one troublemaker in the building, we at least got to have a conversation. Right. And so, yeah, during the course of this meeting, um, you know, he, he made it clear that, like, it, he his expectation was that after the Trump tweet that I was sort of lay low, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? He's like, you, I thought you were sort of lay low, and when the Jerry Jones thing popped up and that didn't happen, did you go meet with him again? No, the, I only met with him once, mm -hmm. right? So it's like when I got suspended, that was pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like tweets happened, it got picked up. Literally the next day, I was suspended, mm -hmm. and no conversation with anybody. Um, high up in the brass, like it, you know, it was one person I did, but like not the president, not Bob Iger, no. So this is like 
probably a good four or five months removed from when that happened. I got suspended in October. Bob Iger and I met in like maybe February mm. of the following oh, year. Okay, okay. Right, because I had to because I came out here for the Black Panther right, premiere. Right, right, so right, I had right. to. I had to wait. I wanted to wait till I was in LA and we could do it face to face. Phone call didn't seem like that was suffice. So yeah, when we met, um, it was a good conversation. And uh, probably the, <laughs> the funniest part of the conversation for me, from what I recall, is that he he said, he's like, yeah, you know, when I suspended you, you know, it was it was pretty much a consensus. And you mentioned Barack Obama. Now this part right here, I have to say, I read every page of this book and was yeah, I looking. Didn't put, I know, you know, I know. I, yep. went, through, I, I went through every uh, page looking for this because we were at the Ebony Power One Hundred <laughs> party, and we, you know, I don't know what we were sipping on the table, but we got real comfortable and familiar, yeah. and we were having a great conversation. I would say how much I love Barack Obama. You know, I hold the Obama. Whatever, and you were, and you told me that Bob Iger and Barack Obama were close friends. Yeah, they were then good go. friends. So what happened, you know, he was like, listen, the policy is the policy. I felt like it was another violation. And that's why you got suspended. Like, again, he wouldn't, I didn't need an explanation. He, I wasn't asking for one. I wasn't saying like, please, no, none of that. I knew what, it, what time it was. And so he's like, yeah. And I think he mentioned he had been in some kind of recent social contact with former President Barack Obama. And he said, he agreed <laughs> that, like, oh, you had no choice but to suspend her. And I was like, damn, Barack. <laughs> I, that was shocking to me. And, yeah, but, but, and, the, and the president, the former president, who I've met on three occasions. And I've been to the White House twice, and then we met on a, a different occasion. And it, it was, uh, it, I actually got an Emmy for that third one. Um, because it was with his town hall after, uh, I think it was the summer of 2016, where, you know, we had a lot of, un- it was Philando Castile, um, you know, uh, um, uh, Alton Sterling, like that that summer, Air Gardner, mm-hmm. all that summer. So at any rate, um, you know, I wasn't, <laughs> I, I thought it was actually kind of funny <laughs> because um, I understood from a corporate standpoint, why I needed to be suspended, which is why I never made a big deal about being suspended. Like a lot of people mm-hmm. did. And I was like, no, nah, I kind of get it. When you go after the money, right. they're going to they right. tap you. Right. It's like, it, it kind of is what it is. It was just kind of funny to me because I, I was just, you know, just sort of in an amusing way thinking like, I thought we was homies. Right. <laughs> Yo, I needed you in that moment. <laughs> to under, li, li, so many that note, Barack Obama, you are a community organizer. You represented people who were being suppressed, whose voices Look, were being they silenced. They said, you ain't going to have these black people after me, all right? Like, Yo, I, I got no beef wait, but one, with the former but one, president, once, none. Once Bob Iger tells you, even Barack agreed, at that point you're like, let's just let it go. Let's just move on. <laughs> yeah, right? Right. You know? Pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, at that point, it, it was... It, again, when you get to a certain level of, of how corporations operate, yeah. it, that's kind of what it is. And I, I know I know what I signed up for. I knew what I signed up for at ESPN. Every media organization I work for, I know exactly what I signed up for. It's just that the only thing that changed is as I went to each stop, I got more leverage. And then there was just certain things over time. I'm like... Well, now you built your name. You built the following. You yeah. built the audience. You built the relationship. You built the reputation. Mm-hmm. So now you just do your own thing. I just do. My, I mean, largely, I'm in. I'm in business with myself, and mm-hmm. it feels really good to be at this empowered stage in, in my career. But, um, you know, I'm very aware that if there's certain, if there's certain opportunities I want to return to, then I may have to make that decision about like, okay, so what are going to be my boundaries, and am I willing to do that? in order to be back in this certain position. Mm-hmm. And the answer has been kind of no. <laughs> the answer, not kind of, the answer has been no. It's like, I, I don't really want to go backwards. Mm-hmm. I want to only go go forward. So now, again, everybody who deals with me, you you already know what it is. I've shown you. So you can't say I've surprised you. So the Unbothered podcast came out of all of this that now you're just so unbothered. Like, you, you're going to do and move however you want to move. Well, you know, I still got bills to pay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But so, but I, I, I will say this is that anybody I collaborate with, you know, like again, take it, take Spotify, for example, you're not going to agree when you're with a court, corporate partner with every single decision. Everybody's not going to agree. 
but we need to at least be like-minded and see certain things a certain way. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to work. Um, and so now I'm just really happy with the fact that, you know, all, all the people that I work with, I can say like, okay, I enjoy this experience, even though everything doesn't always go my way. Everything doesn't have to, but I'm, you know, I'm getting a lot out of it. And then plus just being able to get into more of the producing, like I'm so excited about, um, doing Collins documentary with Spike Lee and, you know, with him directing and me executive producing, like I'm very excited about this project and, uh, you know, everything comes full circle since. It'll be on ESPN. <laughs> well, well, and I know Colin's team says, like, he still trains every day, like he's going to return to the NFL. Where does that determination go if you believe it's not happening? But he didn't believe that. Mm. You, you know, and, and the one thing, so many things drive Colin, and, and one of, of the many reasons why I can't wait till people see this documentary is the people, there are a lot of people who don't understand him. And there's a lot of false narratives put out there about him. And when they see this, frankly, a lot of people who, a lot of people would be embarrassed by the opinions that they had about him. But he is so singularly driven in a way that is really remarkable. Um, because the one thing he doesn't want to give the NFL, he doesn't want to give them the leverage of being able to say, we called, he wasn't ready. Because there was the time where they did call or they said they were giving him a chance to... Yeah, try he to... was ready. They weren't ready, mm -hmm. right? And we got a whole thing on that. So that will be in the documentary. Oh, yeah. It's a but was lot. that also performative? By them? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it was absolutely. To make us all say, see, we tried. Yeah, and by the way, NFL tryouts don't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Like, anybody that's covered the league or knows the league know that, like, if a team wants to sign you, they bring you in. The team does, mm -hmm. right? And if it was a real trial, then you would have had, like, it, it wouldn't have been, I think it was on a Saturday. It was on a weekend. Yeah, it was on a Saturday. So we'll see this all play out. Yeah, you'll see this all play out. And it's going to be some very, mm, I hate to use the word shocking. That feels so cliche. But uh, there's going to be some revelations in there that are going to deeply embarrass some people. So Carrie Champion and you have a show, Carrie and Jamil. We had a show. You're not doing it anymore on CNN Plus. No, you you know the CNN Plus. I know, it went away. It went away. That that happened. Oh yeah, because Don Lemon was going to do something on CNN Plus. He was a lot of us. But were. you two connecting, both coming from ESPN. She's gone now, from ESPN, right? Yes, she yep, she is gone. She has her own show on Amazon. And you're not doing anything together anymore. Uh, you know, Carrie and I are gonna always figure out a way. <laughs> yeah, because I I've only seen her in action one time. I went to ESPN with Floyd Mayweather while they did an interview, and I thought. She was really good. And looking at how both of you are really good, but di in two different ways, I thought was great coming together. Yeah, no, I mean, like, she's one of my dear friends. Um, you know, our relationship, like, we we met at ESPN, and people were sort of trying to pit us against each other. And I was never on that energy, and neither was she. And, you know, we became, like, really great friends. And, you know, CNN Plus was really unfortunate it had obviously it had nothing to do with us. They decided it was like literally a grand opening, grand closing. Uh, I, I jokingly refer to it as the best job I've ever had because I got paid for not doing anything <laughs> for like a year. <laughs> so, but I remember I saw you one day and I go, Hey, we got to get Kanye West on um, the show with you and Carrie. You looked at me, you're like, For real? <laughs> <laughs> you did. It would have been like, entertaining. Oh, yeah, it would have been entertaining. Oh, no, it would have it been it would have been great, but you know, they made a decision to, to fold the whole deal and. Um, you know, Karen and I were, were disappointed, even though we had a show on Vice, which was great. And this was going to be the next evolution of that. And we're always ideating about ways we can work together. No, I think that would be great. Okay, um, one more thing I wanted to ask you, and I know we're going we're gonna to get into some games really quick, but there was something in your book where you talked about, you know, my gay ass got to ask about this. <laughs> you said that you were once very unsympathetic towards the LGBTQIA community. Correct. But you also had a friend that you didn't know at the time, right, mm -hmm. was a part of our community. Mm -hmm. And how you found out, I thought was such a beautiful story. I wanted to tell that really quick because I feel like we're in such a conversation now where the other night I saw Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union. And I was saying to them, you know, how much we try to support Zaya by sharing her story, but also how much backslash she gets because some people are just not ready to embrace our community, embrace young people who identify themselves. But I said we try to promote that um, as a way of honoring her, but also honoring the platform that she's built to advocate. I feel like you including that story in this book was important because you were, again, vulnerable in sharing your own 
misunderstands or not really understand mm -hmm. the community and then having that personal experience to Yeah, education. I mean, it was a, a really dear friend of mine who I did not realize was gay. And, you know, much like, I mean, I, it's not a unique story in the sense that a lot of us, especially a lot of us in the black community, we are raised with some level of church upbringing, be it we had to go to church a lot. I did. I grew up a lot in Baptist churches growing up. Or you have strong elders in your family, <laughs> parents that... Even if you're not in church every week, those values are set in your home. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just regurgitating what I had been told. And that's not to give myself any excuses, but it was such a life changing moment for me because when he did eventually come out to me and I realized the things I had said to him in the past, I was deeply ashamed. And it's not about my shame, I deserve that, right? It was more or less, I was ashamed because at what is a sensitive, most vulnerable time for him, I wasn't there for him the way that I needed to be. And I, you know, I apologized for it. And there was never any beef. And he was like very appreciative that we had that conversation. And in fact, when he read the book, he was like, you still think about that? I was like, yes, I still think about that. And it's what drives me to be so passionate about sticking up for the queer community um, is that there is, especially now, when you add in the deep sense of transphobia that is happening, I'm not going to adopt the same values as white supremacists. I'm just not doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think we as a community need to be careful because as they often say, the devil gets you by showing you something you like, mm -hmm. not something you don't. Mm -hmm. And so what I will find in these intersectionality conversations that we have is that we'll be like, yeah, yeah, social justice, yeah, yeah, justice, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you bring up a different group of people you don't agree with, and then suddenly you siding with them. Mm -hmm. I ain't siding with them <laughs> right. on nothing. Right. So it's like, you know, that's something that I think that we need to check. Is that, you know, it, it unfortunately historically, this has always been the case, is that eventually the oppressed mimic the actions of the oppressor. Well, and what I love so much about the book, why you guys have to go get the book, is I love, there's so many different intersections, right? There's your mother growing up with Muslim faith, and then I think she wanted to dibble dabble on Christianity. Then oh, she more than dibbling. But then, and more than who, dabbling. Who, who Y'all were going to be, become Jehovah Witnesses. Like, there's a whole, she did, she did there's a whole in that religious one. journey in yeah, this book. She but did. I love how you told the story about the man who caught AIDS. Yeah. My Separate stepfather. and apart from Correct. the the issues related to your friend mm -hmm. identifying as gay, because I think oftentimes when people talk about HIV and AIDS, it's a gay person's disease. And in here, when you talk about your stepfather who caught AIDS and ended up dying from AIDS, it was like, wow, like it's important to know that AIDS is something that affects all people. Yeah, and then not only that, even within that, you know, he was facing a struggle. I didn't understand at that mm -hmm. age being somebody who. I think what was deeply contributing to his hardcore drug use was living in a deeply closeted existence. Mm -hmm. It's like not feeling like he could be himself, you know? And certainly him and my mom went through a lot of trauma and pain because when she, uh, when he told her that he was a bisexual and, and all of that, um, I, I do feel like sort of the, the trickle down effect for him from that was that him trying to bury himself and because he wasn't fully able to live his complete truth and live in who he wanted to be. Right, but also he, him in doing that could have hurt your mom too. Correct. In, in many ways. Yes. And so to still have empathy for the gay community, for people who, mm -hmm. you know, because some people have these experiences and they get personally traumatized where it builds a stigma that you can understand it, but you know, you didn't let it affect you. No, I mean, I didn't. And, and even after seeing his or understanding his experience, you know, I, I still held what I would consider to be, you know, probably bigotish views toward the queer community in the sense like relying too heavily on how I was raised and not really digging down and understanding people's lived experiences or what they were facing. And so I'm thankful that early on, you know, in my very early 20s that I had two really good friends who came out to me, one a man, one a woman, um, that really reshaped how I thought about these issues and not because sometimes people you have these experiences that are individual and then they stick it to the individuals and mm. don't apply it to the community. Mm. They say, oh, you know, it's sort of like the white people who may be, you know, bigoted and racist. And then we ask them about an individual black person that lives next to them. They'll be like, oh, but they're different. 
no, I wasn't doing that. It was mm -hmm. like, no, I'm going to take their individual experiences, apply them to the whole community. Yeah. Well, Tucker Carlson incident. recently with the shooting in Nashville said that the trans what are with these trans transgender issues with the Christianity and now making it a transgender trans transgender anger issue that drove her to go and shoot all the him them, I don't know the proper pronoun, mm -hmm. they're dead now, to right. go shoot up all these kids at an elementary right. school. Even though it's funny how like 98% of school shootings have been by, you know, white heterosexual men, right. but we have had no conversation. I'm sure Tucker Carlson's never had a conversation on his show about the raging violence within white heterosexual men. It's so crazy. Every time I see Tucker Carlson with that mullet or whatever that is, I always think he's transitioning. So I don't ever know what's going on. Girl, come on out, girl. We we no, we don't want you. Stay over there. We don't want them over here. All right, no, listen, we're gonna play some games right now. Oh my. Now here's the time where we get to have a lot of fun. Some oh. people call it mess. Ms. Jamil Hill's here. Um, She's already had an uphill battle, so it's all downhill from here. <laughs> all right, so we uh, like to play this game called Name Drop. This is a game where I'm going to drop somebody's name, a celebrity or a public oh, figure's Jesus. name, and the first thing that comes to mind has to come out your mouth. Okay. Okay? All right. All right, cool. First person, Megan Thee Stallion. Oh, adoration. Complete and utter adoration. Like, um, I would probably say in my top five want to interview list, like she's She's in the top five, and she ain't five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just I just texted her the other day because she looks snatched here. This was not too long ago, but she's she's doing something, working out keto. Some she looks great. I know. I saw a, a photo as you know as we we're recording today of her, and I was like, oh my god! Like she already always had an incredible yeah. body, but it looks like she's taking it to another level. And there's part of me that wonders with everything she's been through. You know, they say the phrase "what revenge body." Mm -hmm. Like, is this her like telling y'all like, hey, mother? I'm still, I'm still here. I don't even know it's just the body, but it's also the attitude. Because since she's been back out, she's like in our face. She's co-hosting, uh, she's co-headlining LA Pride this yeah. year with Mariah Carey. So I'm happy to see Meg doing well. Me too. Okay, next person. Tom Cruise. Now, recently you tweeted, <laughs> I think there's a very credible argument to be made that Tom Cruise is the greatest movie star. Am I tripping? Um, no, because like... All right, just think about the massive amount of hits that he's had. Now, I go back to Tom Cruise from like All American, right? Because I'm 10,000 years old. <laughs> so it's like All American, Risky Business, mm -hmm. Top Gun, Days of Thunder, like Mission Impossible, and Mission Imp all now, of those. Yeah. And then, then the fact that he's doing his own stunts, uh, you know, Last Samurai, uh, Few Good Men. It, it, I think there's an argument to be made that he's the greatest movie star ever. Did you see the video of him driving his motorcycle and then he drove off a cliff and then? He was literally shooting the scene and then the parachute opened. I mean, I saw him hanging from a plane, like for Mission Impossible. Like, this dude, I, I'm this dude has brought a different level to movie making. I know some people have been like, greatest action star. I was like, movie star is different from actor, mm -hmm. right? Like, Denzel's an actor. And I, I don't say that to shade Tom Cruise because I think he can act quite well as well. But like, I think when you encompass what a movie star is, mm -hmm. Is this dude? Look, mm. he single-handedly brought people back to the theaters in 2022. Facts. Yeah. Okay, this next person, Tamara Hall. Now I know you were recently on her show. That's my homie. Did you? What do you think about? What do you think about Tamara? I love Tamara. Uh, I know a lot of people. I think they were on her. Was it about Larsa Pippen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we see Lar Larsa Pippen. Her her history, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm, I'm not here to judge her about her history, but like when you have that kind of history and you go on a talk show with a journalist that of Tam Tamron Hall's credibility, what do you think you're gonna be asked? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't surprised by it. I saw what Portia had to say about it. Mm -hmm. Again, when you're on a show like Tamron's and this woman has won Emmys, she's very well respected, she's not gonna pull any punches. Um, it, it's funny, cause like after I was going through my Trump stuff, um, Tamron was, was like one of the first people I had dinner with. And so she was like a great support system, like really was a really good friend. And so, yes, I'm biased. Mm. And so I think people who complain about how she conducts her interviews, some of them are just frankly not accustomed to being interviewed by real journalists. Well, Charlamagne recently said, and I kind of agree that Wendy's missing now. And so Tamron's starting to... Tamron ain't that starting messy. Y'all tripping. Starting to turn that, turn is that not, lane. Yeah, I don't see it. It might be Tamron Williams. I don't know. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to do my girl like that. I think Tamron's still, she's still holding it on the up and up. Mm. Okay. Next person. 
She's a talk show host too, Mary oh. J. Blige. Um, you said she was a dream guest to interview? I got to interview her, she was on the podcast. And little did I know, and you you couldn't have told young young Jamel this, young teenage Jamel this, who was absorbing what's the 411, that she would one day be my co-star. So, because mm. uh, we, we did power, I, I say that loosely and, and totally in jest, yeah. but technically, yes, we were, uh, I did Power Book 2. And so uh, we had a scene together, uh, me, her, Method Man, and that was great. Damn, her method. That's a, that goes back to the '90s. Yeah, I mean, probably the best time, the best part of that whole experience, uh, doing it last season, um, and you know, I don't know, I can't confirm or deny. Maybe in this season as well, but uh, the best part was the in between takes because you know, when you film on a TV show, it takes a really long time to do like maybe three three scenes, mm. but in a where we were shooting, it was me. Mary, Method Man, um, uh, Woody, um, who who plays Kane on on, on Power, um, it, it was like a group of us, and we were just in there kicking it as her and uh, her and Meth were telling amazing stories. Like I was sitting in there with them for a good almost two hours, and if you would have just told my younger self like one day you're gonna be in a room with these people, I would have never mm. believed you. So. Mary is a queen. Okay. We love Mary. All right, the next person, Kobe Bryant. Mm. Now, he, he once called you the sports Oprah. He did. This is true. Um, you know, it's still even hard to believe even now that he's gone. Uh, I hadn't been in L.A. that long when he passed, and I've just never seen a city mourn somebody. Like, they're still not over mm -hmm. him not being here. I mean, it, his presence is still very much felt over this city, and when he called me that, uh, that's one of the highest compliments I've, I've ever received. And especially my relationship with, with Kobe reminds me so much of how the relationships kind of used to go in sports media because I spent a lot of time in locker rooms covering different teams and athletes. You write something critical about an athlete, you usually had to show up the next day and face them. And y'all went back and forth, but everything was all good. You kind of had an understanding. And so when I was critical about what he said about Trayvon Martin, uh, and this is back in like 2014, 2015, he called me right away and before the show ended <laughs> his team had sent me a message he called you on your cell phone no he didn't he uh his somebody from his team did he had jumped in my dms on twitter and was like i need to talk to you me and this we had never had a personal conversation i've been in media scrums and we never had a personal conversation then he did call me and uh we talked on the phone for maybe 45 minutes and he explained to me his position because I, I thought uh, it was a big profile done on him. I feel like it was a New Yorker. I'm not en entirely sure. And he said some comments that I thought were really insensitive about Trayvon Martin and that whole situation saying, you know, innocent until proven guilty. It felt very pro George Zim Zimmerman. And I was like, I, you know, I, I criticized him about it. And what he willingly admitted is that he was sort of thinking about his own trial experience. And applying that to that, I'm like, this is this is different. Mm -hmm. this, these are parents that lost their child mm -hmm. who was just walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And some self-appointed vigilante jumps out of nowhere. And this is what happened. And he understood my perspective. I understood his. And after that, we got really cool. Mm -hmm. And when he called me that, it was after we did an interview at the BET um, Awards weekend, which he agreed to do, I, you know, that still blows my mind because he gave me his number and was like, you need anything, you call. And when BT asked me to do a genius talk, he was the first person I thought of and I texted him and said, hey, would you be down? He said, absolutely. And we had a great interview, a great time. He shamed me for not watching Finding Nemo because I'd never seen it. He was <laughs> I ain't never seen it either. He's really big in animation. I yeah. mean, he won for an animated yeah, project. Yeah, yeah, he won yeah. an Oscar. Oscar. And uh, even then, he was he was talking about his love of storytelling, and when I reconnected with him later, after he retired, and he showed me around his his office where he had these animators and all this creativity happening, it was really clear that he was very happy retired, and I never saw that for him. Mm. I thought he wrestled with it because he was such a great competitor, but yeah, I mean, it was the the kindness. Um, the generosity Kobe showed me, I, I'll never forget. Mm. Yeah, I think that's what makes it all the more um, difficult to understand with him being gone so soon. Yeah, yeah, because he, 
I thought, especially later in his basketball career, I think he was really starting to show people who he really was. Mm -hmm. And to have this other part of his sort of creativity go as well as it did with getting into storytelling and animation and, and film, um, it was just really quite devastating, mm. you know, the way he died. Okay, um, the next person. Ah, John Morant. John Morant. <laughs> yeah. Waving the club, waving Man, the gun in the street. Listen, club. we all have been in our twenties. I can't imagine being in my twenties and having as much money as he had. Only thing I want y'all to do is, uh, you know, we got to practice some situational awareness, homie. <laughs> like we, we got to. It's like you can't be up in the club, the strip club. The let's strip be, club. let's be specific. With your shirt off, right? <laughs> Why you got your shirt off? Is what I want to know. And I, you know, I don't even watch sports, but didn't even know. Who he was until this happened. Oh, really? No, and now it's all over Hollywood yeah. Life. We post him every day now. Listen, I really, first of all, he's one of the most exciting players in the NBA. I have every confidence that John Morant, like this was just a blip in the matrix. He's going to be good because I think he really does, you know, get it and understand it. It's just 20s, a lot of money. Bored. Right. <laughs> you just out here. <laughs> I was like, I mean, God knows. Well, hopefully I have some he strip goes club to stories. stripper rehab and puts the guns down and just. Yeah. I mean, that's the main thing. It's like stay you, off social media with and, it, and you you don't have to IG live all of right. You know, because those you know, I, I've been to a strip club a, a time or two yeah, in my day. But I also understand <laughs> you do like, not IG live when it. you're young. You come from wherever you come from, and then you get some money. And like there does have to be a certain level of awareness now. Like, you know, you talked about as yeah. you become a public person that, you know, these folks will give it to you, but they also ready to take it but, away too. But the, why we need to, if we're, if you're older, why you need to have a little more grace with it. Because everybody's like, why would you be on social media? And I agree, like that's kind of common sense. The other part I had to realize and understand this so I wouldn't sound like old woman yelling at cloud is that social media is their street corner, right? Like. When I was growing up, you, you didn't have to have IG Live because you just had, the homies was already with you, yep. right? So they everybody saw it. But for them, this is their street corner. Mm -hmm. So like that's how they know how to relate and connect. Mm -hmm. And he just has to understand, like, everybody don't need to see everything you're doing, man. Right, that part. Okay, speaking of that, the next person, Ian Wilder. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we see everything, every country y'all in, uh, all the vacations. <laughs> Now he might IG laugh from strip club. No, I'm just kidding. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't do that. He would not. I mean, no. I mean, as I told you earlier, and and uh, you know, the best. He's the best decision I've ever made, mm. and uh, he has brought out parts in me that um, I didn't know existed. Awakened parts of me that I didn't know existed, and most importantly, the growth that I felt in our marriage and just in our relationship period as a person is just something really rare and unique. And so um, I, I love him dearly. And I I have to tell myself sometimes, because you know, people, people on social media get to saying stuff. And I'm, <laughs> I have to, I have to honestly, it took a while for me to publicly sort of expose our relationship because people can talk about me. You can't talk about him, mm -hmm. right? And I know, he can handle his own, and I don't, yeah, you, as a woman, you're always aware of that perception, too, of, like, you come running to your man's defense, everybody, like, he can't defend himself, he need his woman. It's like, no, f that. Like, I one of y'all up over here. <laughs> Wait, but now, now that, I mean, he's good looking, he's all social media, are they, are they in his DMs? Uh, oh, women? I know the girls are in his DMs. They might be. I mean, I, 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 mean, once I, I don't you go, think so. I mean... You don't you post them, but do you, don't, you do you tag them too? Oh yeah, I tag them. Oh yeah, you gotta get access to the DMs. I don't. I don't even do all that. You don't. No. I mean, here's this is what I I truly truly believe is anything the Lord want me to find out, I'll find out. That, that part. And I I I have never been the woman. I'm not going through your phone. I don't care about your passcode. I like none of that. We don't have that type of relationship. Mm. I trust him wholeheartedly, and. <laughs> He, he, I mean, he's so super honest. Like, <laughs> I can't say there has not been like some women that have. He's told me all about it and showed me the message. And it's funny. They on a flight to India looking at y'all doing <laughs> Stay the hell out of there. You know what's so crazy is I've been sitting here looking at you. Do you do people tell you that you and Chloe Bailey look like y'all could be sisters? No. Yes. Not at all. I. 
<laughs> I mean, I take it. because Now I that y'all look at y'all can't unsee I it, I huh? take it. The one I've heard... Um, I love Chloe. I've heard Young Char Jackson. I've heard Aaron, Aaron Hernandez's ex. I just can't believe Aaron Hernandez was gay. Right? That's the guy, the, the football player the that they said had the love. Yes. I would have been in jail with him, but I couldn't have been in prison with him, but I could have been in jail with him. And what was the other one? Oh, Taraji uh, P. Henson. Those are the three celebrity lookalikes look -alikes I hear. Watch the Chloe Bailey. Y'all going to look now? Now I'm going to be staring at You're not going to be able that. to unsee it now. Okay, well, here's our next game, which I'm excited about. It's called Erase the Shade. <laughs> So we all know Jamil is very active on Twitter. She's actually been suspended twice for it. Mm -hmm. Or were you suspended once and fired once, or did you quit? I've never been fired. <laughs> she, she's the only major celebrity broadcaster we know who has been held accountable for social media violations. I've been yes more than anybody, which is crazy because Trump was tweeting the most reckless every single day, and there's no accountability. Ain't nobody gonna check the president anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this one you put up. Let's get into this first one. Oh, well, let me set up the game, right? Okay, so now this Erase the Shade is a game where if you've ever said anything crazy or anything perceivably crazy or put up anything publicly that you may have gotten some backlash about, this is your chance to erase the shade. Okay. Okay, now some of this may not be shady. It may just be what <laughs> okay. it is. Okay, so the first one. Uh, there was a post uh, from a guy named David Hookstead who said ESPN has gone so woke it's top two stories today are about women's college basketball, not the men's tournament, not NFL free agency, and not the upcoming NFL draft. Women's college basketball takes the top two spots at ESPN. Who is asking for this? And then you said, so now going woke means ESPN supporting the women's basketball tournament that check notes uh, they are paying $34 million a year for. It. Congratulations for being a clown. I ain't taking that back. <laughs> no, I meant every word of it. And the thing is, the men's tournament, their games weren't even playing that day. It was like literally the women were the feature piece. And again, ESPN, it's their tournament. Right. They're not supposed to support it? Like, that's what they're supposed to do. So you're just a fool. Like, that, <laughs> like, no, no, shade stays intact. <laughs> well, I don't even know what a hookstead is. I'm not even going to go look. Okay. A dumbass is what it is. <laughs> Period. All right. Here's the next one. Um, Ali Alexander <laughs> said, you bleaching your hair is whiteness, privileged actress, and a clown. And you said you definitely were the kid who up the pizza party for everybody else. P.S. My hair isn't bleached. <laughs> Not taking that one back because, yeah, I was like, these are... Who are all these people with blue check marks talking crazy they to you? They probably paid for them, right? Like, now that's the thing. This is this is Elon Musk's Twitter. It's like, you have... I mean, Twitter already was starting... Had been the wild, wild west. But now you have this, this sort of crop of utter stupidity that has become so much more highlighted because of the way that Twitter is now run, the way the algorithm is. And so, and you can pay for it. So now every time I see somebody who has like a 7,000 character tweet, I'm like, oh, sh pay for that? Right. Listen, I, I've said it before. I know supposedly what is some April deadline of when the legacy, I think I'm a legacy blue check of when they're all going away. Oh, so we're going to lose our blue checks? I don't give a I really don't. At like, this point, I the blue check means not, nothing. Yeah. I don't. I don't care. It's yeah. like I, I. I will not put. It, it could be twenty five cent a month, and I promise you, a apartheid clad is not getting my money. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. Well, you. Well, I can't wait to lose my my blue check because I'm, I'm like, not giving any money up for you. Okay, here's here's one. This came from the Hill. <laughs> uh, a story that they wrote: Kid Rock accuses media of labeling him a racist. Say he loves black people and letter teasing Senate Bill whatever. And you said he loves black people so much that he pandered to racists by using a flag that unquestionably stands for dehumanizing black people. Yeah, Kid Rock doesn't represent my city. That's all I know. And uh, when he went on that whole country turn, this is a true story. So I, I went to Michigan State, I used to work at a college paper called The State News. And Kid Rock used to call every week to get us to try to review his album. Really? Because this is back when he was a rap when he was doing actual rap. Yeah. And he used to beg us to review, and we used to laugh at him all the time, like, who is this <laughs> kid rock dude? Like, that's what we would say. And then obviously, you know, he became a much bigger star. And it was like, oh, okay, well, congratulations to him. He made something of himself. But then when he made the heel turn into becoming a country guy, and then suddenly waving the, uh, the Confederate flag, it's like, homie, you from Romeo, Michigan. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to claim heritage and I hate, 
what, what's the Confederate roots in Michigan? But it was almost he was pandering to his audience. No, the same totally way he Trump was. Yeah. And so and then he got mad when people called him out for like myself, like you being a racist. And so, um, yeah, I think he's a stain on our city. Mm. Well, I don't think he's ever recovered from attacking Beyonce either. Because I remember <laughs> they put so many bees on his page, I couldn't even see what people were mad about. It was just bees everywhere. Okay, Giddy. here's the next one. Another blue check. He said, I can define woke in 15 <laughs> seconds. It's a flawed ideology of social justice and radical social transformation that blames the woes of minorities on white people and, in particular, white men. It promotes identity politics to demonstrate one's virtue over sound public policy. I have to say, this is my shade before we get to it. That was the longest Ooh, that explanation. that was some word of, salad, wasn't it? That was a lot. My mind was trying to wrap itself around all these different words. Like, what does that mean? You you simplified it by saying, y'all are so bad at this. Woke has literally not, never meant this. And no matter how many black folks tell you in diff tell you differently, because the word came from us, y'all just going to go ahead and dig deeper into making your own whiteness the centerpiece, historically extremely familiar. It's true. It's like white people hijack the word, much like Donald Trump hijacked the whole protest that Colin Kaepernick was doing because they needed to center themselves. And so now anything that white America doesn't like is labeled woke. It could be like, I hate tequila because it's woke. What the <laughs> does that even mean? Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? And so it's become just this pejorative, just all encompassing, all encompassing adjective that doesn't really mean anything. Meanwhile, like I remember like back in 09 when I first joined Twitter, people were using woke, but they were using it differently. Like they would tell you, like, hey, the cops out on sunset, stay woke. Stay woke, yeah. That's yeah. how we used to use <laughs> it. Like, it. Like a warning. Like, like it was up. a warning. Yeah, it was yeah. like, yo, stay aware, right? And so then they these clowns just hijacked it um, because they can never think of original and here it well, is. there's been so many hijacks and misinterpretation interpretations that I had to Google it the other day and say, what is woke? What does it even mean? Because at this point, I'm trying to make sure I'm woke. <laughs> but did you see that woman? She was doing the interview with the black journalist and she said, you know, all these people are woke. And she said, I'm sorry, you've said that a couple of times. Can you just explain what you mean? And she said, and she melted she couldn't. down. That was, and she wrote a book where she has a whole chapter on wokeness, on wokeness and melted completely down. So to me, that's where the media failed. Because when they first started slinging that word around like it meant something, people should, journalists in particular, should have asked every single politician who used it, what does woke mean? Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, we would have seen a lot more of those woke She said, Ooh, um, it's going to take a long time to explain. She said, we got time. That <laughs> Whoever you were, that was the shade that yeah, I lived for. Yeah, she did for. that. All right, y'all better stay woke. Okay, here's the next one. Uh, Piers Morgan mocks Angela Bassett, who didn't get the memo at Oscars. And you said, I find this really I, I find this really ironic coming from the guy who acts like he hit Meghan Markle with a do you like me? Check yes or check no. And because she hit him back with a check no, he's been perpetually in his feelings. It's true. I mean, like he told that story about how she stood him up and like this dude ain't been right ever since. It's like, you know, he and there was a brief period where Piers Morgan was actually kind of a respected interviewer. Mm -hmm. And He's now turned his whole persona into being this constant objector of, you know, of black women in particular. So, nah, so far, like nothing you, you guys have presented, I actually take back. I'm like, <laughs> I wish I would have thrown more shade, <laughs> if <Yeah>. anything. <laughs> well, that's why I say I, I, don't, I don't know that you're going to take it. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, I'm going to show you this clip of when I went on Piers' show, but it was about Meghan Markle. I didn't know his relationship or his infatuation with her. And I felt like the people, like they had lined up so many people to bash her yeah. that once it got to me, I said, I'm going to get this whole clip off before they get me up out of here. I'm going to show you the clip when we're done. Okay, the next one. This is literally the devil, Ron DeSantis. Ugh. He said, it was great celebrating Black History Month at the mansion. And he put this photo up. And you said, the secondhand embarrassment I feel for the black people who actually performed for the man behind banning prominent bo uh, books uh, by black authors statewide. You know, and a lot of people are like, well, what are they supposed to do? Because he controls state funding. They ain't got to do that. You know, it's, it's got to. Is, is, is this Coonan? Um, well, you know what? I need to find out more about who they are. Okay. Because if these are young people. That don't know. That they're... don't know any better. Or for that matter. You hear governor's invitation, and maybe you're not understanding from a wider scale what that means, but whoever the adults were in charge should have never let that happen. Every black person in the state, I don't give a damn who he called. <laughs> when your child him. comes home with a permission slip to mm -mm. go perform somewhere and it tells you it's Rob, the governor Ron DeSantis, you, the answer is hell no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, like no. So 
Um, I, I thought that was a, a terrible moment. Mm. But unfortunately, to some degree, a, a reflection of what's happening in Florida politics because there's not enough happening on the ground. Mm. Okay, here's our last one. Um, there was a photo of an uh, NBA basketball player, Will Chamberlain, <laughs> with his two great Danes at his home in LA County, uh, California. And this is of, in 1974, this is Ebony Magazine. You said, it's part of the larger plot to emasculate and feminize black men asking for the fake outrage police on Twitter. Yeah, because like all of a sudden when Jonathan Majors, his Ebony cover, which I thought was amazing. I thought it was great. I thought it was really well done. That comes out and then there's this loud, ignorant contingent of people who are just like, they trying to destroy the black man. I was like, with some feathers? I mean, like, really? Because well, okay. I thought it was the criminal justice system. Maybe I'm tripping. Well, now it's the white woman say he beat her in a taxi. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Jonathan, I, good luck. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on there, but I will say this about that situation is that to me, the, the more kind of disturbing conversation about this is that there's been so many of us who have been like, oh, that's why you need to be with a sister. I'm like, what do you mean by that exactly? It's like, again, I don't know if he did or didn't do it. Like, who knows? Like, that's for the courts and the authorities to decide. But let's just say for argument's sake that he is abusive. We need to be with that? <laughs> right. Like, it's like black women can take a punch? Is that what you're saying? Right. Because that's how I feel like people are saying. Is it's like, oh, no, if he were with a sister, she would shut up about it. Right. Really? Right. Like, I, I mean, it feels like a backhanded, it, like, not a backhanded, it feels like an insult. I think people online are just stupid, though. They don't really think through what they're going to tweet. They yeah. just say the dumbest shit. I do see that perspective, but I also think it's equally crazy that all these brands are dropping him. I do, too. Without him having his the day The army, court. like, it's like, we, there's so much about this that we don't know, and it's, it just seemed like a very quick Reaction. I feel like Adidas hung in there long, longer with Kanye <laughs> they did. than they did with him. I was like, damn. Until like, they got to the finals and we got They were go. like, yeah, we okay, gotta we go. got to put on this. But right. no, that, that part has been very, very surprising is that they have lined up to, to do it. But it, it just sort of brings into context is that a lot of times when it's black folks, particularly black men, at the center of something like this, the the reaction is immediate and swift. And I'm not saying that people who do actual dirt don't need to pay. Of course they do. And we don't know that he even did anything. But the fact that, that there's been this immediate rush to judgment by the people in business with him is very telling. Right. Well, listen, one other thing is telling is that we've not given you your gift yet. But before okay. you get out of here, we have a gift right here on the side of the chair, and because you've been infamous in your tweeting, uh oh, and have gotten suspended for tweeting. Okay, I don't. You know, this feels kind of big. It doesn't feel like a paycheck. It's a redemption. <laughs> no, definitely not. It's a redemption. It's a redemption gift. <laughs> and I'll, I'll share one with you. Oh my gosh, this is brilliant. We will not get suspended over here or denied by wanting him to be locked up. Have you ever seen anything more foolish that a person can have people climb up a Capitol to try to kill the vice president and the, and the speaker of the house and take over the government and stop an election and still he be free and questioning why there's a witch hunt? And not only that, will probably be your presidential, Republican presidential nominee in 2024. It's going to be him. Will we get in trouble for saying lock him up? No. Are you kidding me? Lock him up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamil, for coming on the show. Thank you. Listen, y'all go get the book Uphill. I'm telling you, I read this in two days. It take You have to take the whole two days to read it because it's, it's 200 and something pages, but it's worth reading. And you know what? Stop judging a book by its cover because we all been through stuff. My book, her book tells you that it was a long process of personal healing to get here. And the fact that you're still so happy and found love gives me hope that I might find love too. I just got to stop touching other people after I drink today. <laughs> you, you know what? You, we all got to come through something. Exactly. Growth, growth. Like, you got it. See, I hope y'all believe in me the way she does. <laughs> Thanks, real Peace.